Well, amen. Thank you, ladies, for blessing us. I'm glad that Jesus is alive. Amen. And because he lives, there's nothing that we face that is too big for him to handle. Amen. Amen. Be turning to Philippians chapter number two. Philippians chapter number two. I hope that um, you are being blessed as we um, have um, been going through the book of Philippians together. And I hope you are um, learning things from the Lord and um, just uh, being challenged in your daily walk and encouraged in your daily walk with the Lord. Um, Today we are... um, Coming to the end of chapter number 2, I'm going to begin reading at verse number 19 and read down through verse 30, but I really felt um, a burden as I was studying that um, God would have us look at this um, from the standpoint of how the Christian life is to be lived, not in isolation, but in community. And um, we'll see this here beginning at verse 19. It says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall, come, shall also come shortly. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For he indeed was sick, almost unto death, but God had mercy on him. I love that phrase. God had mercy on him. Amen. And not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. I pray you'd speak to our hearts. Fill me with your spirit. Lord, give us ears to hear what your spirit wants to say to us. Speak to us this morning. Encourage us with your word. Help us live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Reminded of what the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. He said, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The nature of the Christian life is that it is to be experienced in community. From the beginning they had all things common, and they parted to one another as they had need. In the community of faith we pray for one another. We share with one another. We encourage one another. We love one another. We rejoice with one another. And we weep with one another. We are to learn from one another, to teach one another, and mentor the next generation of disciples. After Paul came to Christ, we find him allowing Christ to literally pour him out as an offering in service to others. (coughs) He mentored those who he brought to Christ and ensured that the faith would live on after he died. In other words, he lived in such a way that when he died, the faith would not die out with him. In that context, he lived out a miraculous life that literally changed the world and continues to change the world even today. 
He saw God perform many miracles through him and in the lives of the believers around him when it was in the context of community. So what can we expect and what are the benefits from living in community with other believers? We find first of all here the concept of productive relationships. Within the body of Christ, we develop relationships that in many ways resemble, if not are even stronger than our own family relationships, because we are part of a new family, the family of God. We sing that song sometimes, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. It is a blessing to be a part of God's family, and it's a blessing to be able to assemble with God's people. God Set, Christ set up his church in such a way that from the beginning we would live this life out in community with one another in the context of relationships. When we think about productive relationships in the body of Christ, we immediately think about the concept of mentoring. The Apostle Paul was always mentoring someone. There was always a young preacher that he was taking under his wing, so to speak. There was always a young believer that he was encouraging. There was always somebody that he was investing his life into so that, as I said, when he died out, the faith would not die out with him. I ask you to think about this question. Who are you investing in? What younger believer are you investing your life in? Now, certainly it ought to start at home with our own children. We need to be investing our lives in our children and in such a way that they not only learn to be good citizens, but they learn to be devoted followers of Jesus Christ. But then beyond that, God wants to use us to invest our lives in such a way that we teach and train the next generation of believers. So if the Lord tarries is coming, the faith will go on after we're gone. Now we find the concept of mentoring. Within this concept, we find two things that are necessary. We find teaching and we find trust. We are told to go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever he, I have commanded you. And Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth or the end of the age. What are we to be teaching? We're to be teaching, first of all, the gospel. The good news that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And everyone's a sinner, so it's good news that he came to save sinners. Amen. He lived the life we should live, but we don't. Die to death, we should die, but we don't have to. And in doing so, he purchased for us the free gift of salvation, purchased for us our inheritance in glory, and now he can change and save them to the uttermost who will believe. We start there teaching the gospel, and we ought to start from a young age. Teaching the next generation that yes, there's a God, and yes, He loved the world. Yes, we sinned against Him, but God loved us so much, He sent His only Son to die in our place on the cross. And if anyone will believe in Him, His death, burial, and resurrection, they too can be saved. And they're never too young to start teaching. And that concept of the gospel that Christ Jesus came to save. But then beyond that, once they are saved, we are to teach them to observe all the commands of Jesus. Certainly the commands of Scripture that we are to live out in our daily lives. The commands of the New Testament to love one another, to love our brothers, and, and to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. To esteem others as better than ourselves. But then also, in addition to that, to teach them to hear the voice of God and to know God's will for their life and then to fulfill it. We teach them in word, but we also teach them in application. And then we teach them in understanding God's call on their lives. There is no one who is a follower of Jesus who is not part of the called. 
You are called for a purpose. Everyone in this room has a high calling of God on your life. And we'll find out when we get to chapter 3 that Paul said the one thing he does, he forgets those things which are behind, he reaches forth to what is ahead, and he presses towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Adrian Rogers said it best when he said the greatest knowledge in all the world is to know God's will for your life and the greatest success is to do it. And every one of us who know Jesus, we have a responsibility to call out the called in the next generation. To call out and teach them to hear the voice of God and know the voice of God. And if we are going to teach them to hear and know the voice of God, we got to be able to hear and know the voice of God. But God has a calling upon each one of your lives. And he has a calling on their life. And he allows us, as we walk by faith, he allows us to invest our lives in the lives of other believers, younger believers in the faith, so that they then might live out their calling in Christ Jesus. As I was thinking about this this week, I am so thankful that I was able, growing up, to sit under some, some great men of God who taught me. And I'm thankful for other believers, lay leaders in the church that set great examples and encouraged me in my walk with Christ as a young believer so that I could understand from a young age the calling that God had placed on my life and I would have the tools necessary to be equipped to go out and fulfill that calling on my life. I think about when God was calling me to preach the gospel at 15. It seemed like for a month's time, everywhere I went, God would bring random believers up into my, into my life, and they would just say things like, I sense God has a call on your life. Or, have you thought about being a preacher of the gospel? I, I just feel like God is telling me to encourage you in that way. And then he brought a godly ev old evangelist, J. Harold Smith, to our church in Old Hickory. And after the Sunday morning service, when we ended that revival, he, he came up to me and he looked me dead in the eye and he said, Nathan, I don't normally say this to people, but I feel like I got to say it to you. God wants to use you in a, in, a way, in a way for his glory, either as a preacher or a singer. And, and if you will be open to his call on your life, God will use you in a great way. I'm thankful that God had men and women in my life who encouraged me in the faith. Who, and, and Timothy could also say that. I'm glad that God sent Paul to my hometown when, when I was young and he invested his life in me and I was able to go on and fulfill God's calling on my life because he brought Paul into my life. There are many Timothys out there. And they need some Pauls who will come alongside them. There has to be teaching to help them understand God's call on their life. But then there has to be trust. There has to be trust in the teacher by the student. If you're going to learn, we got to trust one another. And we've got to be open and teachable when God brings someone into our life who's trying to invest in our life, we have to have a teachable spirit to be able to receive from them and then grow from the teaching they're giving to us. But then also there has to be a trust in the student by the teacher. We train the next generation of leaders, but then there has to be a time, and I'm afraid this is where sometimes we miss it, as we miss it in the church. We train the next generation of leaders, but there has to be a time when we trust the next generation of leaders to lead. If we are going to see the work go on after us, if it's not going to die out with our generation, but if the Lord tarries, it's going to keep on going for generations to come, there has to be a time when the, this, when the previous generation of leaders entrust the next generation of leaders with leadership. Will they make mistakes? Yes. 
Will they still need mentoring as long as you're alive? Yes. But we have to, there has to come a time when we entrust them with leadership. What am I saying? If I've done my job as a pastor, I will have trained others to take the ministry after I'm gone. And if you've done your job, you will have trained others, mentored them to take the leadership after you're gone. I think of Brother Ray Gardner, who is my spiritual grandfather in the faith, who invested his life in my dad. He's still alive, and I still get to talk to him from time to time. He pastored Oaklawn Baptist Church in Winchester, Tennessee for 45 years. And when my dad was a young preacher, and I was like four years old, that God moved us to Winchester. And dad sat under the preaching and teaching of Brother Ray Gardner for a few years while he was going out as an evangelist. And I think of how Brother Ray invested in my dad. And my dad invested in me. And now God has allowed me to live long enough to now have spiritual sons who are also in the ministry. I think of men like Ted Stofel at Campaign Baptist Church in Rock Island, Tennessee, who surrendered to preach at Morrison Baptist Church when I was pastoring my, my first church. And I was so young, I don't know how I taught anybody anything. But God somehow used me, even in my youth and inexperience, God used the preaching of his word to get a hold of Ted's heart. And now Ted is pastoring and doing a work for God over near Sparta. And I, I think of other men like Jay Baker, who, who was my Awana director at my first church, and how um, God is now still using him as a lay leader in the church to, to reach the next generation, to reach young people with the gospel. Back in the summer when I preached over in Smithville at the Bible conference, uh, Jay came up to, to me, he, he was in the service, and he came up to me, and he said, I just want to thank you. He said, I'm still serving Jesus, and I'm over there at campaign helping Ted. And, and that, that blessed my heart to think that, hey, because uh, I'm a nobody, but God, is, God uses nobodies to make a difference in somebody. And then he'll use them to make a difference in somebody else. And we will not know until we get to glory the impact that our lives have made because it just keeps on going on. It's like a snowball effect. It starts small, but it keeps on going generation to generation as we're faithful to invest in the lives of other people. Think of Cody Tidwell, who's the youth pastor at Compassion Church over in McEwen. Having, o having over 50 teenagers show up to their youth service on Wednesday nights in McEwen, Tennessee, of all places. That God allowed me to invest just a little bit in him. Now, he had a lot of other people investing in him, as well as, well as Ted and Jay did as well. But God uses us when we make ourselves available and we make a conscious effort to encourage and invest our lives in the next generation of, of leaders, God will use us to make a difference in their life, and then he will use them to make a difference in the lives of other people. And it's my prayer that they would go on and far surpass anything that I was ever able to accomplish. Because it's not about us making a name for ourselves. It's about the kingdom of God being advanced and the glory of God being displayed in all the earth. And when we re invest in someone, you never know when you're investing in the next Billy Graham. You never know when you're investing in the next Lottie Moon or Annie Armstrong. You never know when you take an interest in that young girl that God might call her to the mission field and use her in a great way for his glory. Or when you're investing in the life of that young man, how God might use him for his glory. May God give us a heart to train the next generation and then a heart to trust them with leadership. What am I saying? I'm saying deacons should be training the next generation of deacons. Pastors should be training the next generation of pastors. 
Bible teachers should be training the next generation of Bible teachers. Soul winners should be training the next generation of soul winners. Worshippers should be training the next generation of worshipers. In essence, Christians should be training the next generation of Christians. And we do that through relationships in the context of community. There was such a trust between Paul and Timothy that Paul said, even though I'm in prison right now and I'm not able to get to you, I have full confidence. I can send Timothy and it'll be just as good or better by me sending Timothy to minister to your needs as if I came myself. May we develop those relationships. That's going to be a blessing and a benefit, not just to the individual, but to the entire body of Christ for the glory of God until Jesus comes. Productive relationships, but then there's also pastoral care or ministry. Now, every one of you are a minister. Let me say that again. Every one of you have a ministry. We have the ministry of presence. What's that? That's being there for one another. Where do you get that? Paul talks about Epaphroditus and how Epaphroditus was there to minister to his needs when he was in prison. And you never know, just by showing up, who you're going to encourage. You never know who you're going to be able to encourage in the context of a Sunday morning worship service. But if you're not here, you may miss an opportunity to encourage someone. You never know, just by showing up on your job, how God is going to use you. You never know how just by showing up at the restaurant, God's going to open up a conversation that's going to open up a door for the gospel to go forth. You never know just by being there who that's going to encourage. And we are to be there for one another. Paul said, Epaphroditus was there for me. And the way the King James kind of reads here, it looks almost like an indictment against the, the Philippian church, but I don't believe it was. Paul was saying, you couldn't come and minister to me in my need, so God sent Epaphroditus who could. It wasn't that the Philippian church didn't want to, but they just weren't able to because of Paul's present condition being in prison, so God sent somebody who could. May we be the somebodies who can, amen? May we be the people. If God has given you an opportunity and you have the ability to meet the need, go meet the need and don't wait. Don't wait for permission. Show up and be Jesus to somebody. There's the ministry of presence, but then there's the ministry of prayer. We find in this passage that the people of God were truly praying for one another. Epaphroditus came to minister to Paul's need. And in going to minister, he gave of himself so much that he becomes sick. And it says the sickness was so great it was nigh unto death. And we find the Philippian believers travailing in their souls when they heard about the condition of Epaphroditus. Their their heart of compassion literally going out to him in his time of need. We find Paul saying that if God hadn't healed him, that it would have been detrimental to me if God had taken him on. We have a ministry of prayer for one another. And in the context of prayer, in community, for one another, God works a miracle. Let me say that again. In the context of community, God's people praying for one another, ministering to one another, being there for one another, our miraculous God works a miracle in the context of that. What a good God we serve, and He's given every one of you a ministry of prayer. You may not be able physically to get out of your house much but you can pray and if you can touch heaven you have one you have the greatest ministry of anyone in this room if you can truly intercede for others 
If you can truly pray until the answer comes from glory. If you can truly go into your prayer closet and, and you can truly touch heaven and make your request known and pray on behalf of others, you have the greatest ministry in this room. Behind every great church and behind every great ministry, there are many people who are behind the scenes that nobody ever sees who are laboring in prayer, who are burning the midnight oil, who refuse to sometimes eat or sleep until they've prayed and they know that the answer has come and peace that passed all understanding flooded their hearts and souls. May God continue to birth in us the ministry of prayer. They are praying for one another. And then we have the ministry of provision. They're providing for one another. The, one of the things that made the church the church from the very beginning, that made a lost world stand up and take notice. When you read the writings of the early church fathers and historians from that time period when they were writing, even some of them from a secular standpoint, writing about the church, they said these people call one another brothers and sisters and they meet one another's needs and they have all things in common. If one has a need and another one can meet the need, they'll step up and meet the need. And, they, and it's such so that anyone on the outside looking in says, I want to be a part of that may we take serious our ministry of provision one of the greatest callings of the church and the one of the greatest benefits and blessings of being a part of a community of believers is we get the opportunity to provide for one another Epaphroditus provided for Paul's needs and Paul says now you provide for his need kind of what Jesus said I was in prison and you visited me I, I was sick and you came to me I was naked and you clothed me I was hungry and you fed me Inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these my brethren you have done it unto me and we find I, I think one reason why Throughout this letter, Paul just keeps almost gushing with his Christian love for the Philippian believers is because they had this. They, they were ministering to one another, ministering with their presence, ministering with their prayers, ministering by providing one another's needs. And what, did Paul, how, what does Paul say to them? Chapter 4, we had not gotten there yet, but if you read on ahead, he says, My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. You can't outgive God. If you see a brother or sister in need, and you meet that need, God will give it back to you. How do you know that? I've seen him do it time and time again. I don't know how he takes 90% and makes it go as far or further than 100%. I just know he does. And I'm not going to ask any questions. I've found in my life that you can't outgive God when you're giving from a cheerful heart because God loves a cheerful giver. And when we love God and we love our brothers and sisters in Christ and we have the ability to meet a need and we meet that need for the glory of God, that I'm going to have a need down the line and I'm just storing up credit. So when I have a need down the line, God's going to meet that need. The ministry of provision, providing for the needs of one another. I'm afraid with all the stuff that's happened, COVID, political divisions, everything that's happening in America, We're losing the sense of community in the church. No matter how bad it is, it's not even worthy to compare to how bad it was in the first century. But they met together. They had all things in common. They knew they were all part of the same family. With God as their father. 
that their inheritance was in glory because they had the most important thing in common, and that was a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so in community, they provided for one another. I'm glad that Christ transcends all earthly divisions. And in Him, the middle wall of partition has been broken down. And we can all enter into the Holy of Holies. We become part of a new family. You may not have much relationship with your earthly family, but God can give you a greater family than even them. One thing that so challenged, has challenged me over the years when I've gone on mission trips to third world countries where they are in abject poverty is I look among the believers and I see joy, and I see community taking care of one another just as God has commanded them to do. And may we do the same. We've all been given ministry that we can do. And then the third thing, not only do we have productive relationships where we're mentoring the next generation, and pastoral care where we're all ministering to one another, but we have powerful moments together, don't we? I mean powerful moments where Jesus said, if two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm going to be there in the midst of them. So I am fully confident that Jesus is here this morning. I had a guy when I went up to Asbury, I don't know if he was a critic or what he was, but when I come out of the auditorium, he stopped me and he said, I want to ask you a question. Where is Jesus? I said, he's right here. <laughs> and I thought about it after, after we left. I thought, I, I wish I'd have said what I thought of. You know how you think of stuff later that you wish you'd have said? I wish I'd have said Jesus is up there, he's in here, he's out there, he's all around me, Jesus is everywhere. And because two or three of us are gathered together in his name, he's right here in the midst of us. And because of that, when God's people get together, there is an atmosphere created where an atmosphere of faith where then God works in powerful ways through that. I don't fully understand how it happens or why it happens other than we serve a big God who's able to do anything, that with men things are impossible, but not with God, because with God all things are possible. But I think about this when he's talking about Epaphroditus, and he said he was sick nigh unto death because of the work that he was doing to serve Christ, because for the work of Christ, he became close to death. And he said, but God had mercy on him. Hallelujah. In the midst of the people praying for him, in the midst of the people getting together and providing for one another and Epaphroditus doing all he could to provide for the needs of Paul and vice versa. We find in the midst of this, he becomes sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him. Hallelujah. He was sick, but God. He was almost dead, but God. Those two words can make all the difference in your life. Hallelujah. I was lost, but God, hallelujah. I was sick, but God. I, I was out there alone in the world, but God showed up in my life. May God show up in a powerful way, hallelujah. Glory to God. Epaphroditus was almost dead, but God healed him, hallelujah. Peter was in prison, but God sent an angel and got him out. Throughout the New Testament, we find awful things happening to God's people, but God using them as opportunities to turn the situation around for His own glory. And also, for the benefit of His people. Now, we don't deserve none of this, but Paul said, 
God healed him because he knew it would be too hard on me if he didn't. I didn't say that. The Apostle Paul said it. Amen. In other words, God knows exactly what you need. And he loves you. He loves you with unconditional love, perfect love. He knows exactly what you need and when you need it. And sometimes he knows that for his own glory and for your benefit, it's going to do more good to reach down and heal you. And then other times, he just says, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength will be made perfect in your weakness. But whether by life or by death, God is moving in our lives. He's working. He's doing miracles that we can't even see. He's using our lives to touch other people's lives that we won't know till we get to glory. The full extent of the reward that has been laid up in heaven so that we can put back at the feet of Jesus. But we have the opportunity for powerful moments in the community of faith. God healed him because of prayer. God healed him because of Paul. God knew it'd be too much on me if he didn't heal Epaphroditus. God healed him because of the Philippians. And ultimately, God healed him because his work wasn't finished. God still had something for Epaphroditus to do. And he's got something for you to do. May we be a community of faith. Right here on this country road in Hickman County. May we be a, commu a powerful community of faith. Where we love one another where we provide for one another, where we focus on the one person, Jesus, that we have in common more so than anything that we would have different from one another. May we meet one another's needs. May we minister to one another in love and in faith. May we pray for one another, expecting God to move and see God do such a work that the community takes notice that God is at work at New Hope giving new hope to Bon Aqua and the world amen in the context of community we too have potential for productive relationships who are you investing in who do you have on your heart right now that God's saying you need to start investing in him, you need to start investing in her, because i got to work for them to do, to call out the powerful calling that Christ Jesus has placed on their life. Who is it that you need to minister to, that God's putting on your heart right now, or ministry you need to participate in? Who is it who needs a powerful moment and a miracle that you need to start praying for? Praying in earnest, praying in fervor, praying in faith. Who needs a miracle? We all need each other, amen? You know, Jesus knew this so much. He told his disciples, it's for your benefit I'm going away. Because he said, I'm going to send you a comforter or a helper, the Holy Spirit. And then he sends us a whole bunch of people who also have the Holy Spirit. To become our family. To encourage us when we're down. To give us strength. To keep going. May we be that kind of place that brings glory to God. Amen. Let's bow right now. Begin to.